Hey everybody, this is Justin Moretto. And this is Thomas Torrey. We're two friends who are starting a podcast. Cue the music. Two friends, two friends. <laughs> we got our title. My hope is that at the end of this conversation, we have our title, whatever it'll be. It's two friends. I'm a filmmaker. I'm a scientist. And we're two friends who've made movies together. And launched a company together. And we lost our money. And our identity. But we are finding ourselves again. And this is our podcast. This is it. Welcome. In this episode, Justin and I give a brief history of ourselves and how we came to make films together and the painful identity crises that followed. In addition, we discuss some of the elements of story, including situation versus plot. Thomas takes a dump on Pixar. I challenge because I love. And I am shocked to learn that It's a Wonderful Life opens with angels in space. Outer space. All that and more on this episode of our podcast. Which will hopefully have a name by the time this airs. It is January 1st, 2021. We made it. Why are we making a podcast, Justin? We talked about doing this back in the shared office days. Back That was like 2015, 16. We talked about doing this. In fact, we go even back even further than that. We talked about doing this as like a film review thing back, oh, true. back, back in the day. And then it kind of evolved. And later we were like, we got to write down our many and constant business failings so that we could, uh, quote, put it in the book one day. And so we were like, maybe we should record it. A lot of the tone and voice of this will be our creative discussions. I think we're still open on what the podcast could become. And it's not just us sort of waxing philosophic, but processing kind of the creative stuff we're going through, talking about the project we're working on. Let's take a step back and sort of share our story a little bit, like who we are, like what our fields are, what our expertise is in, and how we came to work together. And me, Thomas Torrey, I am... I'm a filmmaker. I'm a, a writer and director, and I do it full time to the extent that I can land freelance work. The paying stuff is usually commercial work, uh, but I'm also doing uh, feature film stuff, and that's certainly the dream writing and directing feature film. It's taken many different shapes, but it's something I've always wanted to do. I grew up as an actor and then s shifted to um, working behind the camera, gosh, as early as high school, really. Went to college, went to Sarah Lawrence College, and that's where I met Justin, not at college, but during that time in Westchester, New York. We bonded over love for film. Justin was a scientist, and I'll let him talk about his own background there. Uh, but we just had a lot in common, and we're fast friends. And then the friendship kind of evolved into a partnership initially back in 2012 when I had an idea for a science fiction screenplay to write. And I said, hey, Justin, I got this idea. Let's write it together. We did that from 2012 to 2014, 15. Just the two of us writing that script. It was called Premise. Um, and around and in 2015, I was working for a television network producing short form content uh, and was at a place where I wanted to leave. I was there for about three years. I can talk more about that time in my life because it was really seismic. <laughs> Looking back, it was like one of the biggest life-changing moments where I decided to leave INSP because what I did was choose to go off on my own. I was making comfortable income, had a wife and all three kids at that time. <laughs> when was Rylan born? Um, Still have. Yeah. I mean, maybe you didn't lose the wife in the intervening years. <laughs> right, still, I still have the wife. Same wife. Kids. But I couldn't remember it was two kids. No, of course, it was three kids. They were all born. And I chose to leave the kind of the comfortable job and finally go off on my own and pursue making films full-time. Texted Justin. It's like, hey, <laughs> would you want to do this together? Because uh, I wanted a partner. I wanted someone to share the pain with. <laughs> and uh, we had such a great... We had such a great... Uh, creative uh, partnership, writing the script, and uh, and Justin was in his own sort of moment of formation. And the short version is we started a film company together, Bad Theology. We both quit our jobs to do that. And then we both eventually returned to jobs after a year or so uh, because of failing to make enough income to sustain ourselves. But the uh, film company's still going. We just finished our second film. I'm still pursuing, you know, I'm still working full time in the business in varying capacities. Gosh, really since leaving INSP and starting Bad Theology began what felt like a really deconstructive and reconstructive period of my life. You know, there's been a, 
identity crisis, financial crisis, spiritual crisis, all of the crises sort of uh, began at that time to some degree and are things you go through. I think hopefully it's natural to go through those things in your 30s. And uh, there's still things, you know, um, I'm growing into and I'm learning from. But that brings us to 2021 now on day one of 2021. I think I knew all that, but it's always interesting to hear it again. I, I always struggle with how to answer this question, I think, because of the identity crisis. It used to be so easy, right? I would say like, oh, you know, Justin, who are you? I'd say, oh, Justin Moreto, I'm a scientist. And uh, depending on what level of sort of scientific interest somebody had, I would, there were like, I always had three levels locked and loaded of explanation of who, who I was and what I did. And that has, you know, very much fallen apart. But the th- one of the things that I've learned, and this, it sounds pretentious, but if I were to rewrite that now, I would say that like above all else, I'm a storyteller because that's the thing that I love the most. Um, you know, but I guess less pretentiously, I would say I'm a writer and I'm a scientist. And I, I had this sort of revelation. I, I, I write letters to my kids, uh, you know, routinely like once a month or once a quarter. And I was writing to one of them and I was talking about sort of my, I don't even remember how I got onto this, but kind of this, the arc of the uh, disillusionment and how, when I look back at myself, I, I was, a, I was always uh, like a smart kid. Right. And I grew up in the time where like people would tell you, Oh, you're so smart. You're so smart. And so I got this idea in my head that like smartness was just a part of who I am. And then I got to college and I started getting into classes that I was like struggling against. And my response to that was it was challenging this smartness in me. And so I started avoiding those. And if I'm really honest, that ended up driving my career path more than anything else. And so I kind of, it was like, what are, what is the thing that you are excelling the most in? And that kind of drove me into what is a very interesting field, neuroscience, that I do love, but it was because it didn't require me to go past calculus three, right? You know, if I had had the work ethic to sort of push through that, like I, I want to instill in my kids and I'm still, you know, at how old am I? 36, still trying to like reteach myself to have more better work ethic. Maybe I would have pursued physics, another uh, discipline that I love, but that terrified me when I started getting into the high, highest level math. So um, anyway, neuroscience, um, studied that, got a graduate degrees and ended up in the biotech field and always had kind of this chip on my shoulder that like, I'm smart, I'm a hot shot. And, you know, I was very good at sort of, I think, hiding that. Um, that I, my, that I felt that way while still obviously acting like that way, kind of, you know, had that very quiet dirt bag sort of thing. And I, I think that's one of the things that led me to so easily like jump off and say like, yeah, you know, same as Thomas, like I had a comfortable job, uh, wife, I think two kids, I still have two kids, but I think I, my son had also been born at that time and I was like, this'll be fine. And it was just like this overabundance of, you know, unearned confidence um, that we could just jump out there and just like, just, we'll just, we'll just do it and it'll be cool and it'll be fine. Which I think, you know, as Thomas said, the business is still going. The business, I don't think was a, a failure of an idea or, you know, m- maybe there were some things we didn't execute on perfectly, but the the biggest failure was just, we just failed to recognize how long it would take to, for it to become financially successful. And, um, you know, just not being independently wealthy, we couldn't afford that, you know, five, six year burn down that it was going to take before it started making money. So anyway, the point of all that is the thing that I learned about myself is that whether it's science or writing, the thing that I love is to the telling of the story. Um, in science, you tell stories through investigation and then it's always about like, how do you make the case for what you believe? Um, so I quit my job at a biotech company, started this with Thomas, had another identity crisis because I was no longer a scientist, uh, but did find how much I loved writing. Um, and Thomas helped me find that quite a bit, uh, and then ended up getting back into the field as a consultant. And then ultimately now as a different type of scientist doing sort of, uh, spectroscopy, um, with, you know, just to be to full disclosure, a brief stint in there of both unemployment and then bartending as I sort of required money to survive. Um, so just cards on the table, there were, you know, there were many dark, months in there of like, okay, $10 left. <laughs> Are we going to make it? Um, I think Thomas can, uh, identify with that as well. That like just tough times of, you know, 
I mean, big ego hit for me to go on unemployment. Per, I mean, honestly, not that I, I literally never thought bad about anybody that was on unemployment. As a kid, I remember going to the food bank when my family was really poor. And, but it was just like seeing my family be poor as a kid, always being like, that. Will, I will never let that happen to my family. And then ending up there, you know, tough. So here's that's where I find myself now. Gainfully employed, um, but also still pursuing writing. Um, not quite as diligently as Thomas, but um, still with passion, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's it's sort of right now, it's the chief way that I'm making income by writing, by pursuing it. And it's it's funny hearing you talk it, it what's coming to mind so much is this the, the phenomenon of the identity crisis and how much of that drove the decisions to sort of leave the comfort of the day job, which was still in my field. I mean, I was working for a top 50 cable network, writing and directing content, but I always had the dream. Put another way, I always had a sense of identity in something else. And so when I suddenly became unhappy at the TV network. I had a real surge of vision and identity. And I was like, I want to start a film company. I'm going to pursue making my films, my way, my art, my creative. And when that had a lot of failure, which I say that proudly because... I think failure is actually a really helpel thing. Oh and, yeah. And it's For not sure. pe- people be like no you didn't fail like no 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 I I did in so many ways and it's a good thing. We also succeeded in a lot of ways and we can talk about the failures and and the you know successes. But the identity was the first thing that got sort of questioned. Even now, January 1st, 2021, I'm still wrestling with that sense of identity. I'm not yet gainfully employed. I mean, I'm still struggling. I mean, I'm I went through several years of real digging deep financial holes and I've been able to slowly dig out of them to the extent that I'm not digging them deeper. I'm still struggling to make it because I'm pursuing this freelance world, which 2020 started off really great (laughs) and then COVID sort of obliterated that. Um, So, and whenever what you're doing is still a struggle, it's only natural to start questioning how long you can do it. And so for the first time I've been thinking like, because I've always been like, oh, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a filmmaker. And for the first time I'm like, should I be focusing on something else in order in order to just make this sustainable? Because gosh, we're going into year six of what's an unsustainable sort of path for me until the work starts becoming of the size where I can really make an income where I'm honestly not living sort of gig to gig. And so for me, it doesn't look like changing careers, but perhaps focusing more on the writing. And uh, so I just finished like my work for quarter four of 2020 was writing a screenplay for, for a production company. They own the rights to a book. They hired me to write it. And that was the most fun I've had all year because I love writing, and when, and I've written plenty of stuff that I haven't directed, um, and I've directed plenty of stuff that I haven't written, but my identity was always as a writer-director. And whenever someone would ask, what do you like more, I'd say directing, because you can control the most, and I'm like a control freak. I have like a vision for something, and I want to control it. And times when I've been really unfulfilled is when I didn't have that creative control. Coming up, we will continue our conversation on pursuing the dream and shattering our identities. And Justin will talk about liquidating his retirement savings. Thomas will talk about questioning how to raise his children. And after that, we will talk about story and the novel that Justin is writing. But first, we want to take a quick break and promote our newest film project, Minor Premise. Justin and I wrote Minor Premise back in 2013 and then eventually partnered with Eric Schultz and Relic Pictures to produce the film. It is a sci-fi thriller about a neuroscientist and an experiment gone wrong. It premiered at the 2020 Fantasia Film Fest and is out out now from Utopia, so rent it wherever you rent your movies. The Los Angeles Times calls it smart and engaging. And the Austin Chronicle says it's refreshing to see a science fiction thriller where the scientific method is truly part of the story. Minor Premise is available now on all video on-demand platforms for rent or purchase. I think the story of 
bad theology. I mean, that's such a big part of our mutual shared history and also what was a very formative point. It feels like it should be given sort of its due to kind of unpack that a little bit, but also this sense of identity. Because, yeah, you know, when we started it, we were <clears throat> flying. Did we get a plane? I mean, we were flying around. We were driving around. We were talking to, you know, rich people, venture capitalists, wearing our suits. We're trying to raise multi million dollars for a film slate. And, you know, launching as entrepreneurs, launching a company that had a smart business model based on, you know, a four film slate that was going to pay us an income. And we had all this vision. We had a pretty sound idea. We communicated it. Okay, it got better as it went along. We had a moderate amount of success in raising low six figures. Um, but then cut to, I don't know, a year versus later, a, two years. A, versus a $10 million initial right. goal. Well, we'll talk about, we'll talk about all that, but then cut to, so that was like the idea, the vision within a few months, we're sort of in the middle of it. By the end of that year, we were kind of depressed. Like we need a win. This isn't quite working the way it, uh, we envisioned it would. And then a year after that, we were fully like out of money personally and, you know, you were bartending and I was like working as a PA on a film set or I'm like, <laughs> I'm offering the cheapest day rate you could imagine for like the lowest level uh, freelance job. I mean, I used to, you know, I ran a department of a TV network where I had like a million dollar annual budgets to produce a slate of short films. I'm hiring dozens and dozens of people as the top dog. And a few years later, I'm like begging to just be a PA on a set just so I can get, a, you know, 150 bucks a day. And uh, for me, I mean, it was, that's, that's very much the equivalent of doing the thing you never thought you were going to have to do again. And uh, I think all that goes back to identity. It's like, no, I'm this. I'm not that anymore. And um, and I and I thought a, a long and hard about leaving the comfort of the day job at INSP, where I was a VP. I was a vice president. Like that was, like I was very young when I got hired into that. Probably the youngest in the network at the time, at least, as a thirty year old. And I, my income from my previous job, where I ran a small video department for a senior living management company, my income, my annual salary almost doubled going to INSP. I mean, it was like the equivalent of just like landing the dream gig. I mean, it was just, it was just growth after growth after growth, year after year. That was a huge leap up. In the three years I ran that short form department and worked for Jim Goss, who is to this day, one of the two greatest bosses I've ever had. It was just like, I loved every minute of it. And then that department got dissolved. I got moved over to a different department and it just wasn't a fit for anybody. And I was like, okay, maybe now is the time to go off on my own. And I thought long and hard. Well, I thought hard. I I don't know if it was terribly long. I mean, it was a few weeks. Talked to Amanda, talked to my parents, sought the people in my life who have influence on me. And it's like, am I crazy? I'm thinking about quitting this job where I got paid six figures and pursuing the dream. And my hope, my assumption even was to make a lateral move. We're going to, I want to start a business that can make enough money where I can just safely go from my six figure job to another six figure job. As if like any entrepreneur, like as if launching a company and making six figures in your first year is remotely likely. Yeah, especially as a first business. I mean, it's one thing, you know, Elon Musk it's going from like, business. you know, PayPal to whatever his next venture was. It's different for us. It's like, yeah, we can start a company. We can definitely raise $10 million. <laughs> no problem. And I remember looking at myself in the mirror and knowing that I didn't quite know how, but I remember saying, is it possible to start this company? And the vision was, I don't want to just make one film's that's too small. Let's make a slate of films. And there was almost a safety in the slate. Mathematically, it was sound, but really starting a company as opposed to just trying to make a film. Because all of my filmmaker friends were trying to make their first feature. I, because I am have a huge sense of ambition, not necessarily to my credit, but it's like, no, I'm going to go bigger. I don't want to just make a film. I want to make four. I'm going to start a company and 
And, uh, and I remember not quite knowing how, but I remember saying to myself in the mirror, is it possible? And the answer is yes, of course it's possible. And then I said, then I'm going to figure out how. And a big part of that was trying to raise income from high net worth individuals. But something my mom said to me early on that I understood to be true in the moment, but I didn't understand what it really meant until several years later. And she said, if you want others to bleed, you're going to have to hemorrhage. And she was saying that in the context of trying to raise income, raise money, raise investment for a company. You're going to ask other people to bleed. You're going to have to hemorrhage. You're not just going to lead by example. It's going to be more painful for you. And she was saying that my parents are in the mission field. They live their life um, basically raising their income and raising their income, not in an investment scenario for sort of a tangible reward, but for relying on sort of a, you know, a charitable, ethical, or humanitarian sort of reward. And so they're used to bleeding, they're used to hemorrhaging, they're used to living modestly. And uh, I think there was a, my mom knew how hard it would be. And I thought the pain would be like, when you try to lift too much weight, you're just like, yeah, the gym, oh, you know, it's ripping your, it's ripping your muscles up. Oh, that's pain. Or, you know, or just, or just sprinting to the end, finishing that race. Huh. It's like, yeah, I know it's going to be painful. Yeah, I can get through it, you know, because I was motivated. I didn't realize the pain would look like despair. Yeah. Depression, identity crisis, true financial ruin. I went broke. I went broke. Yeah. I mean, I liquidated my entire, uh, my entire retirement. Like, you know, and I've always been an aggressive investor and an aggressive saver. I mean, when I was at Biogen, I, I say I put at least 30% of my my salary every year into uh, 401k. And then, you know, by the by the end of, oh God, 2017, I mean, I had liquidated all of it. And that was like after, you know, and I, you know, I started investing hard in 2000, late 2008 at the bottom of the market. So it had grown, you know, a lot. And yeah, I mean, it, it hurt. It still hurts sometimes to think about it. The thing was like the the money hurt, but the thing that I didn't know having, I come from a family with like just riddled with mental illness, but having personally never dealt with like depression yeah. before this, this episode, you know, little bouts here and there, but nothing that I would qualify as, or that I would say qualified as what most people would, con- you know, with depression would consider having never dealt with it. I didn't realize how much that, that would hurt. And like, the, mm-hmm. you know the despair that you're talking about that was way worse than the money like than than the pain of like watching my money disappear it was the despair of like who am i what have i done to my family and like yeah you know not not recognizing the sort of the value of the failure in the moment but identifying as the failure in the moment that that sucked because at the low point you really do like for me i was like what have I done to my family? Like, am I that selfish where I've pursued a dream? You know, in the low point, you're like, I pipe dream. Yeah, I want to be a filmmaker. I want to be famous, rich and famous. It's like, who doesn't? And I've I've given up a, a comfortable, secure job in order to pursue that. Can I, how can I be so selfish? To what end? I've, you know, I, I, I have never been great with my money, but we had a good six months security of when I like got my final paycheck at INSP. I had a, 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 hand, a little bit, you know, we had um, cash and savings. I had retirement savings in there. You know, when I take some of the retirement, you'd pay those penalties. And it was like, ah, oh, this is such a, a bad financial, like you know, you're supposed to just leave that there, but I had no other way to get income. And, and, you know, to the point where, oh, there's, there's actually nothing like the like the cash that's in my checking account is really all there is. Um, and that is a very scary place. And for me, all of the depression identity stuff got mo- most acute when the money was low. I mean, there's still a tie that I even now I, can't, I haven't quite figured out. Like I just, you know, if, if I'm at if I'm at the end of the cash, I just am full of anxiety and stress then I'll land another gig and I'll fill it back up again. But that 
and and I probably most Americans are used to living that way, where you just you make your money and it depletes, and you make the next thing, and it's exhausting. It's it's unsustainable, and uh, I'm 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 still in that cycle to a degree, uh, and it's and, and I'm questioning how much longer I can do it. Um, I talked to another film friend who's working in the business. He's directed films, you know, they're on Netflix and, you know, he was driving Uber last year and he's like, you know what? I'm kind of like, if, if I saw a way out, I would take it. And I think his way out might be in the form of teaching or something. And I was just like, everyone's got their breaking point. And I keep thinking about mine and I keep envisioning, is there other stuff I could do? And it's like, nothing comes to mind that fills me with any sort of vision or joy as in making films <laughs> so I just sometimes I just feel stuck it's just like I'm on this path and I just have to suffer through it and if I make it when I make it it's really just gonna be not because a I didn't quit but it's like I couldn't quit like what I couldn't I, I couldn't I don't, I don't know what else I could do and maybe that's my problem I should just go do something else and hate it, but like make a steady income. Like that's probably the safe thing to do. And maybe there'll be a point where I'm at that point where it's like, okay, I'm just going to go get a job, you know, sell real estate or sell point of sale systems. Cause my friend owns a business and he's like, Hey, anytime you want to come sell point of sale systems. <laughs> you know? Well, and this actually, I mean, but I'm not at that point quite yet, but I don't know. You know, you and I are roughly the same age. I think, you know, I, I imagine our parents are wildly different. It'd be crazy to put them in, in a room together, but I think there's something about, you know, we've talked about this before. We come from, a, I feel like we need a different designation for our generation because we're like the four to five year generation that um, like grew up with internet, but without social media, you know, like kind of like the, the, the oldest millennials possible. Anyway, that's not the point of what I'm saying, but the point is like, I remember um, my, my, my parents and um, a lot of my, mostly my stepmom, some degree, my dad, kind of like this idea. And it wasn't just them. It was like the culture, the zeitgeist, whatever of like, you know, uh, you got to find your passion. You got to find that passion. You got to chase it. And like my, my stepmom used to say all the time, like, if you find a job that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And I know that's so trite, right? But you'd say it all the time. And I feel like, uh, and my wife, she does something she loves. And I almost feel like, that is wrong. It's that if you if you if you follow your passion and you you find a job that you love, you will never have a day off in your life, and that's the truth of it. Because if it's something mm. that you love, you literally cannot stop. And it makes me, and I'm curious how you feel about this, but it makes me reconsider how like what I want. How do I want to teach my kids? Do I want mm. to? What's the better route? Is it like find something that you're good at? Like, you know, this is so random, but there, I was watching Dirty Jobs, like back in the, you know, with Mike Rowe or whatever. Uh, and this was when we were uh, in Charlotte. And there was this episode about this guy who was like a septic tank cleaner. Have I told you the story before? And um, Mike Rowe was in there. Sounds familiar. He was like crawling in the septic tank with him and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then he like, he, the septic tank guy takes him back to his house to wash off. And it's like this like beautiful, like manse of a house, right? And he's like, what? And he's like, hey, man, Like, he's like, no, I don't like doing it, but I'm good at it and nobody else wants to do it. He's like, that's the key, right? Find something that you're good at that nobody else wants to do. And I was like, shit. <laughs> charge for, charge anything you want. <laughs> yeah. And so anyway, it just, it makes me think like, would I rather, and those are obviously extremes, but like, is the better thing, like tell your kid, like just find something that you enjoy doing and do it. Um, And, and, and you know, just do it well, but like, don't expect to become rich or CEO. But see, then that feels like, am I then like trying to like undercut my kids? I just don't want them. Like, I want them to st strive. I don't know. Maybe that's the wrong word. Do you get what I'm saying? It's this like, is, I'm struggling with this. I know, I know exactly what you're saying. This is like, I think about this all the time because my instinct is to push my kids to follow their dreams and the things they want to do they're like, they love, like my daughter's an amazing creative. She could be an entrepreneur. My boys are like amazing athletes. They could get scholarships. And my instinct is to push them to want to follow their dreams. But my instinct is also to try to prevent them from the pain that I've experienced and want to make it easier for them 
to hit their dreams. But then I intuitively know, well, that's not going to build men and women of character where they, they follow their dreams easily. So it's like, but do, do I want them to struggle? Like, I guess the, what I'm hoping, what I'm assuming is all of this pain and suffering that I've gone through financially, you know, with identity, career, it's all building a better Thomas. And once I achieve success, I will be a better person. I'll have some more character. Hopefully I'll have, you know, gratitude and humility in success. Like that's sort of what you're hoping and what you're like, otherwise it's like, well, this pain is, <laughs> it's just pain. It's not actually redemptive pain. Um, this is, this is the core of this book that I'm adapting right now in the screenplay. So it's a memoir called The Cliff Walk by Don Snyder. True story, obviously, memoir. He wrote it in the 90s. He was an academic. He had a very big sense of self and ambition and white privilege entitlement. Uh, as I'm an, I'm, a, I'm an author, I'm a best-selling author, I'm a literature professor. And then he gets let go from his teaching job. Academia, academia discards him. He can't get a job for two years, and he goes through this shattering identity crisis. And he realizes his sort of entitlement and privilege was not really earned, but was just sort of granted. And and uh, he ultimately finds himself by joining a construction crew as an unskilled construction worker, and really um, and uh, and and finds a new sense of purpose, and really finds the grace and dignity of manual labor. And and kind of the conclusion of his book is knowing who you are. And he uses death of a salesman as sort of a running theme, which is all about knowing who you are. You know, Willie Loman is this salesman who didn't know who he was. And Biff, his son, his wayward lost son, kind of finally discovers who you are. And, and it's this sense of identity. Who am I? And for Don, the writer of this memoir, he recognizes this construction crew. These men know who they are. Like these blue collar men of all different stripes and because they know who they are a grace and dignity attends their work so it's not that manual labor is inherently better but it's because their identity is solid they know their selves they know themselves and i think he would say to anyone who knows himself a grace and dignity will attend your work which gets at the heart of if i really knew who i was thomas tory i should be able to do any kind of work and do it with grace and, dig and dignity, because it's not in the work I'm doing, but it's in myself. So, I that would stand a reason. I don't. I still haven't quite found myself. I still am going through an identity reconstruction, and I kind of identify with that. I feel like I am. I'm right on schedule. I feel like I am going through an identity reconstruction or just an identity discovery, a true self discovery, which is a good thing that hopefully everyone can go through. But maybe the ones who need it are this generation like you're talking about where we're brought up to be like, follow your dreams. Because if you're just brought up to like shovel shit and do the hard work, you're not really going to have identity crisis because maybe your life's more survivalist or it's just the sense of, no, I just, you know, life is life and I got to like work to live. So you don't have an, you don't have a, you yeah. don't, you're not, you don't have an identity crisis. You know who you are. And for those of us who big, big dreams and big ambitions... I just I feel like so many, of, so many of us were told that like, you're going to be a star and not, yeah. you know, not, a, not doesn't mean like an actor or whatever, but like, you're going to, you're going to rise to the top. And I just like, I think that there is, you know, I, politically and all that, I, I'm very, you know, like, I feel like there's room for everybody. Um, and you know, that in a way that, that our society doesn't currently support, but that's a whole different topic that we can cover. But I I also recognize there's a certain amount of zero sumness to it, right? And like you, we can't all be CEOs and we can't all be, you know, whatever. Now, that doesn't mean I think that CEOs should make 10,000 times as much as their sort of low-level employees. In fact, I you know, I'm, maybe this is actually a good time for us to sort of pivot towards creative because I, I have, you know, I, I read Thomas's script and it was um, I, I said this to Thomas, it was very hard to read because it was like, it was, it hit so close to home with the like recognition of like, yeah, I did have that entitlement. And yeah, I did think that I deserved for some reason, all of the things that I had not recognizing like that I had just fallen into so many of them. 
Um, and so it was very hard to read in, the, in, in that sense, but then it was also beautiful and, you know, it made me cry a bunch of times because of, you know, this guy's journey and, you know, he did a great job uh, in, in the writing of it. And so I, I think that that, you know, it kind of um, I, creatively, obviously, I very much enjoyed it. But then also just in what you're talking about, this uh, this identity um, finding. Writing the script has felt very formative. Like reading the book made an impact on me. I loved the book. Getting to write this screenplay felt like a gift. Like I was I at, at every juncture, I was just filled with gratitude, partly because I was in you know, a desperate financial spot. So, which I have been for, you know, for the last five years. So, but there hasn't always been work. Like I've, I've, I've largely resented a lot of the work I've had to do because it's come up against my sense of identity. I shouldn't be gigging. I thought I moved past that. I was a VP, damn it. Right. Then I started a company and now I'm back gigging again, doing below the line gig work. And that's, that, that that's an arrogance I, I concede and 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 I resented it for that and so for me to be able to eventually come to a place where a lot of that um, entitlement got kind of beaten out of me came to a place of of really in the last two years all the work I've had I don't know if it's just been better work but I've been intensely grateful for every gig and for the people who've hired me who reach out to me and it's felt like a gift. And I've recognized that. And I was like, oh, I don't want to lose this. No matter what direction my life takes, no matter how big I might get. And, and I still have those hopes and those dreams. And I'm still trying to figure out where the right place for those to be is. Because on one sense, you will, you know, you, you, you're, you have a path. Um, but in another sense, that living in the fu- that future narrative of your ambitions is really unhealthy. So I'm, I'm thankfully kind of getting stripped from that. But uh, I never want to lose that sense of gratitude. Uh, and so to be able to do a script like this that is actually speaking to the very things that I'm processing was really a gift. But, you know, I've also, you know, written tech copy for like, you know, hard drive companies and actually really enjoyed it. <laughs> it was good work, you know. Yeah. Up next, Thomas admits he's the one person on Earth who didn't like Pixar's new film, Soul. I liked it. You didn't. Well, Justin thinks he knows what It's a Wonderful Life is about. I know what it's about. But first, we discuss the paranormal science fiction novel that I'm working on, and Thomas explains to me the difference between plot and situation. At least according to Stephen King. So stay with us. So, Justin, you are sort of officially full-time back in the science world as a full-time scientist, consultant, um, but yet you are still working on creative projects. What does that look like for you? What are you working on, but how are you also auditing your time to work on something that has nothing to do with sort of, you know, your main source of income, but it's creatively fulfilling for you. And why are you doing it to what end? Are you, is it just to have something fun to do or, or are there still those creative ambitions that are propelling you that way? Yeah, it's funny. You know, I think uh, t- telling people that I'm a scientist is is so nebulous. Like when I used to tell people I was a scientist at, um, at you know, a Fortune 500 company, a biotech company, and they were like, oh, wow, that's so fancy. And then, you know, in in that time, I never really had this inclination. But now retrospectively, I feel like I got it was so, you know, full of myself because the reality was like most of what I did back then was plumbing, right? And it sounds silly to say that, but it's like, I would be looking for steam leaks and pipes and stuff. And it was just like, it was dirty grunt work with a fancy title. Um, and like physically looking for physical leaks and physical pipes. Yeah. Like you would take a bot, we called it snoops. And it was essentially just soapy water in a spray bottle. And you would spray the connections and look for bubbles because like if a, if a, if a bioreactor wasn't holding pressure, you had to manually go find where the pressure was leaking out of. And it was a hot, sweaty, dirty job, uh, not glamorous. Right. And, um, my job now is completely different, but still, like nobody knows what, what my day looks like. My wife doesn't even know. My, my kids, like, sometimes I mean, they forget that I work, like that I even have a job because you know they don't really see me doing anything. But you know, my day is I I, I work from home before the pandemic, and and I, I love my job because it's very much like problem solving, and you know, travel the world. But then other than that, I'm a stay at home dad, right? I would drive my kids to school and I would pick them up, and uh, you know, I would be gone for maybe a week every month. Um, 
And so my days are very much my own. I don't, my boss checks in with me once a month, but I, I work with customers one-on-one. They need problem solving. I help them. I do data analysis, right? And so my day is very fluid. I, so a lot of times I don't, even, I don't know what I'm doing that day when I wake up, which sometimes is frustrating. Um, and I know would would drive a lot of people insane, but I kind of like the free form nature of it. And so the, the, the mechanics of it is that I, I, I try to write a little bit every day and it's not always on the same thing that, I, you know, the project that I'm working on. Um, but I try to write. So that's kind of mechanically what it's like is I try to just work a little bit in every day, you know, three to 500 words. Um, and you know, a lot of it's garbage. Um, but it's just to sort of like keep the, the routine of it. Are you writing prose? Mostly. I mean, like I said, I write letters to my kids. I count that because it's sort of me sort of just generating, you know, something, um, prose or, um, you know, I, I have to, I do write a fair amount for work, but I don't really count that. Maybe I, I should, but, and I'm also, not, I don't actually, I don't literally do it every day. I try, I, my goal is four days a week. Um, and I have a project that I'm working on for a while. Um, and as to like why I'm doing it, this is, it's one of the things that I recognize sort of throughout this process is that um, I, I have this list of story ideas and there are currently 10 story ideas in it. And this list of 10 story ideas goes back almost all the way to college. And I have these ideas and a few of them are like really personal. And this one that I'm working on now in particular, it feels almost like it existing in me is like, it sounds bad, but like it's poison. Like I, I need to get this out of me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, last year, or, or I guess this would be 2019. I finally was like, all right, I'm going to do this. And I had, I don't know, like I had 20,000 words written. Um, and again, this is not script. I realized that I'm more like long form fiction is my preference because there's, especially with this content, there's so much that I want to explore. And I had like 20,000 words written and it was, what was it? It was like November. And I was like, you know, what? I'm going to write this by the end of the year. And so I set myself a goal. All right, 100,000 words by January 1st. And then my family was going to Puerto Rico for Christmas. I was like, all right, I'm going to hit that goal before I go to Puerto Rico so I can read the whole thing while I'm there. And then I did it. I mean, I, like I had a chart, I was keeping track of it. And it was like 1,500 words a day, which is insane. Um, and it felt so good to get it out. And then I like, I didn't know what to do with it. Anyway, I let it sit for a long time, read it, edited it. Felt like it was missing something. I was telling Thomas about this earlier. I, I read a book uh, called Little Fires Everywhere, uh, which is fantastic and beautiful and so much more well-written. I mean, like, I, I would love to be able to write like that one day. And it made me realize there's this whole part of the story missing. Like a whole third of, of the story is just missing. And so now I talked to Thomas and this is kind of in a, a sort of proto version of what we're doing right now. I was like, Thomas, I feel lost. Like, you know, I want to do this thing, but there's all this advice. Like, don't ever add chapters to something you've already written. Uh, but I feel like I need this. And we sort of danced around it for a while. And then finally, all of a sudden, like, I think found what I was trying to do. And like, honestly, I, you know, I have an excellent therapist and he has helped me come to terms with this. I don't actually like expect to make money off it. I'm not going to, I'm, I will not be quitting my day job because of the blockbuster success of this book. It is like, it's, it is a, uh, the way I just like to describe it, it is, is a, um, it is a story about quantum mechanics, ghosts, and depression. And, uh, so it's a very niche audience. But will you try to get it published? I, I would love to have it published. I mean, it, it's, I, I'm not doing... So it, it, it's not just about it getting out of you. You ultimately have a, a drive to have it shared. I, I would like people to read it because I think, you know, my own personal sort of... It, it is a very personal story. You know, it deals with like suicide of a parent and sort of grappling with that as a child. And, and so there's a... I, I think that there there are people in the world, it, obviously assuming that I can get it edited and, 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 uh, written well, who, who would enjoy it and benefit from it. I don't think that is like tens or hundreds of millions of people. I don't expect it to have that level of success, but it's like, if I can, you know, <laughs> essentially if I could like get to the point where I write it and it's sort of a break even proposition on like, I'm not having to pay to publish it myself for 13 people to read, then I, that would be great. But you know, even still, even if I just write it and it never gets published, I will, I will still be happy. I will not be disappointed if it never gets published. It, 
I just do feel like I need to finish it, but I need to do it justice. I guess is the, that's, that's the scary part. That's the part that makes me not right. Like that's, that's where I'm at right now. It's like, there's a point where it's like the the very next sentence that I write feels like it's going to take me in the wrong direction. And, uh, I've like kind of set it aside for a few weeks because of that fear, which I know, you know, and Thomas was telling me earlier how he just read, uh, on writing by Stephen King which is a book that I love. And he has this idea in there. I think it's, it, it's that book about, how, I think he calls it like writing your first crappy draft. Was that, did, was that in there? It wasn't Stephen King who said that about the first draft. He might've said that about early work. I mean, he's a guy who's written 60 novels and he certainly like talks about 60. His... It feels like hundreds. Is it really only 60? I think it's only like 60 something. Um, yeah. I just finished on writing today. I was looking for something to read over the Christmas break. And I've had it. I've had it for years. I've read bits and pieces of it, but I wanted to read it cover to cover. And um, and loved it. And man, almost everything is extractable. Yeah. From on writing to screenwriting, like he's talking about novels, but almost everything, even what he talks about with character description, narrative, even the stuff that you would think is really prose specific, is so translatable to screenplays. Not everything, but almost everything. And uh, it's just an incredible, incredible book. And um, even like some of the stuff that stuck out to me, kind of the aha thing was him talking about situation versus plot. And uh, he's like, I don't think about plot. And I was like, yes, I identify with that. I don't think about plot either. And it actually really annoys me when something's too plotty. Like Tenet is just plot. The Pixar, like I can rant about Pixar for a minute because I love Pixar sort of, but they've becoming they've become increasingly tedious for me. Like Inside Out and now Soul were two movies that I liked how they started, but then they just became these deep dives into plot, but like these thematic existential excavations, and they were just like what What do you What does that mean? Because you know, assuming that anybody ever listens to this, there are going to be people who are like, uh, plot. Cause there's, there's so much to it. Like, you know, you talk about like theme versus plot. I still struggle to like find the theme, but like, anyway, I'm really into what you're saying, but I'm, I'm curious when you say like that, uh, Pixar has become too plot driven. I, I will answer that question. Um, so let me just finish the thought on, on Stephen King when he talks about situation. He's like, I don't think about plot. I think about situation. A situation is, let's use Soul as an example, Pixar's brand new movie. The situation, an aspiring musician is going to finally get his big break playing jazz uh, before an audience for this amazing quartet. And you think the tension's going to be, but he's also a teacher at a middle school. And it's that's a situation. You know, what if a middle school mus- music teacher got his big break? That's the situation. And I was so invested in that. I was like, this is great. This is a simple story well told. And they've made simple stories told well in the past. Even really high concept one like Monsters, Inc. It's brilliant. Uh, but then the movie, he dies and then his soul is going to go to the great beyond. And he's so preoccupied. It turns into something else. It's not that. It's like when you describe what's 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 soul about, you invariably have to either talk about really broad concepts like theme, like, oh, it's about a sense of purpose or your drive to kind of do the one thing you were always meant to do, which is not a plot or a situation. That's just theme. Or if you say, but, but what happens in the movie? Then you have to start saying something quite complicated where it's like, well, a guy dies and his soul is trying to get back into his body. But he goes on a, like, he, he teams up with another soul. Like, it's just, it's really convoluted. And, and the convolution, like, the what happens is the plot. And plot should very rarely be something we think about as we're writing. Certainly very little about what we're planning. And that's Stephen King's thesis. He's like, I think about situation. Like, what if a writer was kidnapped by a crazed fan? That's misery, right? So it's like, what, what are these books about? You can, su- you can summarize a Stephen King book, and the thing you're summarizing is a situation, usually in the form of a question. The Cliff Walk, this memoir, its memoir is a little different. It covers several years, but you could also say, you know, what if a scholar was discarded by academia? What would that do to his sense of purpose? I mean, that's sort of the question. That's the situation and it's not really plot driven because it's about him sort of discovering himself. 
So even gray, you know, all movies have plots and plots are the twists and turns they take, the things that happen. But your ideas almost always come from a situation that's compelling, fair. We made a feature film, Justin and I, the first film of Bad Theology Pictures. We produced it together. I wrote it, directed it. And it was a very sticky, cool little situation. What if an Uber driver found himself driving the man who was secretly sleeping with his wife? That's not a plot. That's a situation. That, that started the idea. That began, oh, I had that idea. And then I just started writing. And all I thought about was dialogue and character. And I obviously I fused all sorts of personal thoughts of like, oh, here's what I'm thinking about as a married man with my own temptations. And let me put those into there. The things I'm reading, like all the things that, that are make up who I am are naturally going to come out on the page. And I'm just writing this situation and the plot kind of writes itself. Now with Fair, I wanted to do something very intentional and actually experiment with plot and situation and genre. And the film, you think it's going one way and then it kind of turns genres in the last third. So in some sense, it's actually experimental. It's a really experimental film. It's experimenting with form. But um, All the Names We Buried, a film I wrote that we're in prep on, we're supposed to shoot this year, we'll shoot next year. It's a situation. You can describe it as a situation. What if two strangers met in the aftermath of a car accident and there was a dead body on the side of the road and they decided to bury it because they knew they were responsible? That's, that's what it's about. That's the situation. That's, and all that happens in the first act. That's not the plot. The plot mm -hmm. is them making that decision. Then what happens after, like all, all of the beats that happen the sheriff starts to suspect something's wrong. The out-of-towner who's actually flipped his car and thinks he's killed the girl, he's stranded. He's trying to leave this town. He can't. The simpleton who helps him starts to get a little suspicious. So all of the, the don't plot... Don't too far into the spoilers now. <laughs> the plot is what out. drives it along. But I was never thinking about the plot. Like when I, even when I outlined it, you're sort of, you start with your situation, you start with your characters. And for me, I find my theme pretty early because for me, that's my guiding light is the theme. But I feel like a good story, and this was a big part of Stephen King's on writing, you can summarize in the situation. That's what it's about. It's about, you know, what if. Any great film should be summarized that way. I'm not going to fault Pixar for really taking big swings with Inside Out and Soul. I think those are worthy movies that should exist, and I liked the movies. It was a good movie, and I didn't love it like most of the world, but I liked it enough. My problem was that I was so invested in the situation and these characters, and then it pulled the rug out from it, and it just became a really plot-heavy, dense, convoluted sort of deep dive and what frustrated me is it, it I felt the self-satisfaction. Like it felt like Pixar was so satisfied with itself because it's so relentlessly clever. I was like, man, what, are they are they done just making simple stories? Because you start with that situation of that musician, that could easily be a live action film. Like I was like, oh, this is why it's animated because they really what they're really interested in in is all this soul stuff in this soul realm, which you really have to do animated. But I remember thinking in the first five minutes, oh, are they just gonna tell a simple story about a guy? And in a way, it elevated the animated genre because why can't why can't we tell a human story in an animated f format or medium? I thought that's what they were doing. Then I was like, oh, oh, okay. It's a you're pouring your Pixar dust all over it. it. This is a Pixar movie. It almost felt like self parody. But again, it's a good movie. I'm glad it's made. I'm glad it's out there. It just I was just like, okay. And and, and, and I, I'm try I'm trying to make the movie what I wanted it to be, not what it wanted to be. The, it, the movie is exactly what it wanted to be, but I'm invoking it because it's an example of plot. It's, it's too much theme, <laughs> maybe. I don't know if there's too much theme, but it's, it's very much a theme. Excava you know, it's excavating theme to a very deep level, but it's buried in plot. And uh, it just, it, it, I found it tedious. I found it tedious and I, and it was frustrated. Kind of hearing you, you know, the way that you're describing it, it, it does kind of make me see like all of my story ideas are situational. This one is like, what if there was a boy that was so devastated by the loss of his mother that he spent his life searching for 
the existence of the supernatural of ghosts only to pursue physics as a career find ghosts <laughs> prove that they are a real but that they are a quantum mechanical uh like a function of quantum mechanics that then takes all of the joy out of it for him right and that's kind of and again i don't know if that is where sort of the the situation ends or if i then i continue like because i guess the second part would be but then what if you sort of secondarily realizes oh that doesn't mean that they're like that they're not real it means that they're more real than he thought right um and so that was like kind of the situation so i started with him right and in the so i'm kind of taking this in selfish direction but um then uh, after reading uh, little fires everywhere realizing that like the mother is such an important character and she doesn't show up until the second to last chapter in the book and but she's so pivotal that i wanted to add her back in so i jumped back in time to his childhood that he alludes to in the book and that you hear a bit about and i'm like well let me just flesh this out and let me tell it from her perspective the idea being and again i guess kind of getting a spoiler territory assuming that anybody ever reads it she would be the main protagonist right and you would spend the first six eight chapters becoming invested in her as a character and watching this sort of strange life unfold and then at whatever point it sort of gets to the you know the point of her suicide there is no explanation there is no like preamble there is no long dramatic goodbye she walks out of the room and then the next chapter is 30, 30 years later, right? And the idea, the point of what I would like to evoke is the, the same feeling of loss that the character uh, that you then go on to follow feels, you feel as a reader. It's like, it's just ripped away from you in the same way that suicide rips people away. But the problem that I'm now finding myself in is that I, so I, I started with this, this situation and then I re- found that I wanted this other important feature to it, which is this, her story. But now I feel like I have a point in time that I have to k- take this other story that I started, and now I have to stitch them together. And I keep feeling like, all right, the next thing that I write, how do I make sure it feels like it's going to start steering me in a direction that's not going to land me back at my starting point. And m- maybe that's fine. Maybe I just explore it see where it takes me and then maybe i weave it back but you know honestly that is like that that is the place that i'm at is trying to make that situation and it it feels like maybe it's what you're talking about i'm trying to make the plot fit the situation Hmm. if the plot is what the what happens um then yeah i wonder i I wonder if like because people talk about acts like the three act structure and i and i feel like i have a really good handle on structure and I feel like structure and plot are almost similar in that they're both retrospective um, tools. Like you don't like plot is what has emerged after you've written. Oh, this is the plot. But situation and character are what you start with. And theme for me, Stephen King, he loves theme. He talks about theme, but he has a really interesting take. He's like, my first draft is just story. It's just situation motivated by the characters and then what happens and then he reads back and he's like then i notice what themes are there what symbolism is there and then my job between draft one and draft two is to clarify and improve theme and symbolism remove stuff that's Mm. off theme off symbolism and lean into stuff but he's also like look if theme is not there naturally don't feel bad it could just be a really good story that's just surface level and that's good enough you know, he's a great non-judgmental writer in that sense. He's not trying to write high art, but he's like, hopefully there is something there, there. And it's like, it's, it's the reason you write it. And, and for me, theme is everything for me because I have great thoughts about life and self. And my art is very much a, a catalyst for me to explore ideas. So theme, the, 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 the greater why of the piece is always something I'm thinking about, but I don't necessarily start with it. It, it emerges after I've sort of let the situation determine the story. Um, and so for your story, to the extent that I know about it, and I've read outlines, I've read copies, pages, and we've talked a lot about it, I would almost wonder if the theme, because what you described is almost thematic versus the situation is, well, what if a quantum physicist proved ghosts 
were real and scientific. Like that almost could be the situation. And then, and then what if that led him to a sense of closure about the suicide of his mother? The first is situational. The second is theme to me is, is the larger sort of, it's the situation and the cool hook of ghosts from a scientific perspective. And that's why I love the, from just a piece of horror thriller genre, it's such a great idea because ghosts are fun, but the scientific authenticity, which you in particular can write from because of your own scientific expertise, that's what makes it really interesting. And the quantum phys physics of it is really compelling. So the situation and then the deeper level of, oh, it's really about a guy coming to terms with the suicide of his mom. That's what obviously makes it personal, but that's what fills it. That's why it needs to exist. If it didn't have that, it would still be worthy of existing because the science and the ghosts would be cool enough. But what makes it from good to great is that sense of theme. Um, and that's like, that's everything. That's when we talk about it, that's what we're talking about. When you think about it, that's what you're excited about. It's not plot. It's not, you know, the ways to get there. In the same way I say, hey, simple story well told, I think the best writers whether they're pros, screenplays, filmmakers, they understand structure. They understand what makes things simple and well-told and efficient. And then they can also choose to really branch off from that. I mean, we just rewatched It's a Wonderful Life for Christmas. Classic. I hadn't seen it since I was a kid. That movie is so crazy structurally. I mean, if you think about it, let me ask you, have you seen it recently? Uh, it's been it's been a handful of years, but I... what what's it about? Tell me the situation. What's like? Hey, it's a wonderful life. Is about so uh, it's been it's been a while since I have seen it, but I think Jimmy Stewart, uh, his character, he works for a bank, I think, or something. He makes a bad decision, which or, or doesn't see something coming, uh, ends up sort of losing all of his money, but then also everyone else's money. It has like this big negative impact on the community, right? And then he says, uh, basically, the world would be better had I never been born. And and then it's like, all right, well, let's show you what it would have been like and see all the ripple effects that you've had. Is that, I mean, kind yeah, of- Yeah, like through an, like an angel. Right, through an right? angel mechanic. An angel shows up. Yeah, in my head, that's 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 the part I remember from a kid. Him being on the bridge and oh, that's right. he's think, commit suicide. I thinking forgot. about committing suicide, the angel jumps in, saves him, and then he's like, you know, they're drying themselves off, and the angel's like, I just saved your life. And he's like, I wish I'd never been born. And he's like, okay, let me show you what that would have been like. That's the last 30 minutes of a two-hour and 15-minute movie. Everything we've just described. Really? That movie has the world's longest act one I have ever seen. It is an hour and 40 minutes of act one of basically you start when this character, George Bailey, is a kid, loses his hearing, and then becomes a teenager, then becomes a young businessman and goes through his entire business career up to the point of almost selling out to the bad guy in town. And then he chooses to do the right thing, but then loses this money and has this crisis. And I was like, like my kids, like I told them, oh, it's about like this. I you don't know, remember I, that I, at all. I know. It's crazy because because what we remember is like is always act two. The situation of, of It's a Wonderful Life is, well, what if a guy who wishes he had never been born was shown that? Like that's the situation. <laughs> but that literally happens so late into the movie. And yet it works. The movie works. All my kids were invested the whole way through. Although, because I was like, oh, it's about this guy who wishes he had never been born. And this angel sort of shows him that. They were like, where is this angel? <laughs> now, Frank Capra, they, they, they do the good thing. The film starts with the angel. It's this bizarre shot of space. And you've got this cluster of stars just lighting up. And this angel named Joseph talking to this cluster of stars named Clarence. And basically, like, Clarence, you've got to earn your wings. I'm going to give you a situation on earth for you to learn, earn those wings. Now let's, let me tell you about the man you're about to go save. And Listen, you think if, if I didn't, if we weren't friends <laughs> and I was just talking to somebody and they're like, no, you remember that part where the, the star and the angel, I would be like, you are bullshitting me right now. I've seen the film. <laughs> exactly. That's not in it. It's, it's so weird. 
Well, it's genius because it gives the movie a real tongue in cheek. Like from the beginning, it sets itself up being tongue in cheek and it sets itself up knowing, oh, there's an angel. Like there's a supernatural element to this because the next hour and 40 minutes is just George Bailey in this town. I feel becoming like I everyone's yes, 30 minute cut of this film or something. <laughs> clearly. It's, no, it's so bizarre. And yet it works. It holds up. It would never be made today. There's no way in hell that screenplay gets produced because, you know, the structure police would say you can't do that. And I would tell most writers, you can't do that. But then the ones who should will do it. And if they make a good movie, they make a good movie. Um, my, my point in bringing it up is that there's always exceptions to the rule. And in fact, the exceptions prove the rule because they're few and far between. And if you do them well, you do them great. And Pixar, maybe they're the best at making the crazy theme coaster plot maze of a movie that Inside Out and Soul is. Uh, anyway, I don't want to get on the Pixar train because everybody thinks, oh, you're hating on Pixar. I was like, no, no, it's fine. I, I like it, which is why I'm so frustrated because I like it so much. If I didn't care, I feel I hated this, is it. A, this is a developing uh, segment. <laughs> Thomas's Pixar corner. <laughs> where we no. just I don't like it enough. Thomas, he goes into a dark corner and takes a dump on some Pixar thing. Before we sign off, Justin and I give a couple quick recommendations for things you might be interested in. What's a light thing you, you're thinking about or you saw or you want to recommend? There is this book that I'm about to read that um, I think it's called. Now I feel dumb because I can't. it's on my bedside table. I can't remember what it's called. I think it's called The Snow Child. And I just heard it was a really beautiful, amazing story about like, uh, like homesteaders in Alaska, maybe about a girl who like gets lost in the snow. I don't know. It's supposedly the, the little girl is a lot like my daughter who is just kind of like a, a wild, feral child. Um but my wife read it, loved it. She, like I think she read it in like 36 hours. So she just handed it over to me. Although I may have to read on writing again first, but I am excited to read that book. So uh, last night was New Year's Eve and we just stayed home. It was very quiet, but I made a Viking mule, which is kind of my favorite mixed drink of the moment that I am evangelizing about because it's made with a spirit called Aquavit. And I had first heard about Aquavit this year. It was in a restaurant and I ordered their mule and it was said made with Aquavit and, you know, um, ginger beer and lime. And I was like, oh, what's Aquavit? And the bartender didn't even know. He thought it was, he thought Aquavit was a brand of rum. He's like, oh, it's, our mule's made with rum. That's why it's so unique. Because I was like, what is it about this mule? As opposed to vodka, which is the traditional Moscow mule. But I looked it up and I was like, oh no, Aquavit's not rum. Because as soon as he said it, I knew he was wrong. So I was like, I know what rum tastes like. Aquavit is a Scandinavian liquor. It's basically their vodka. It's made from potatoes like vodka, but it's spiced. So it's a little different. So it's not vodka. It's its own thing. It's Aquavit. And um, it's usually in the cordial section of a liquor store. And, you know, there'll be a thousand brands of whiskey and vodka and gin. And in the biggest warehouse here in Charlotte, there's three brands of Aquavit in the cordial section. And uh, in one other liquor store I went to, there's only one brand of it. And in small liquor stores, you can't find it. So it's hard to find, but they should have it in any big liquor store. And it makes the best mules because it's like, it's just got this little bit of spice. It's almost like a Christmassy sort of spice as opposed to cinnamony, almost like a nutmeg thing. Very mild. And I've got two bottles at my house. One's Norway, the other's um, Denmark. Uh, and so, uh, and Sweden makes an Aquavit. So basically it's like if you're getting, you know, from Norway, from Denmark, from Sweden, their kind of spirit, their in-house spirit is Aquavit. And a friend of mine, uh, who went to Iceland, she's like, yep, I brought home a bottle of Aquavit from Iceland. So, um, it's their version of vodka basically, and it's spiced and it makes the best mules and, uh, do four ounces of Aquavit, a half ounce of lime juice, half ounce of simple syrup, shake that with ice, uh, put some lime and mint sprigs and maybe even a blackberry or two if you can and then uh pour ginger beer fever tree ginger beer is my favorite brand over after you shake it up and it's the best mule i love it i had a birthday uh party and we had mules on the menu so we were doing viking mule moscow mule glasgow mule kentucky mules i love a good ginger beer mule and my kids love a virgin mule which is just basically ginger beer with some lime in it but uh, I'm spreading the word on Aquavit. All right. I'll check that out. And yeah, so the book, just to circle back, it is called The Snow Child. It's by uh, Eowyn Ivy. 
I think it's I think it's pronounced Eowyn. This was a good, fun chat. Hopefully we can do this regularly and create something that is fulfilling for us and fulfilling for a listener. Justin, Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, my dog, my man. Thanks for listening to episode one. Please help us grow our audience by subscribing to this podcast wherever you listen to yours, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or elsewhere. Rate us, review us, tell your friends about us. And those reviews really are important. So don't, I mean, the five stars are great. Love it. Love the stars. But write a, write a review as well. Tell us, Thomas especially, this is not just for the numbers. Thomas needs to hear these words. Guys, I need the ego boost. It's been a tough time. Please. Go to an Apple store and just do it in every demo phone you can find. If you want to stay connected to us throughout the month, you can follow our Instagram account at Two Friends Pod, where there's already a bunch of awesome photos of me and Justin. And get in touch with us at Two Friends with a which will have all the footnotes from this episode and links to the resources that we've discussed. Thomas, my man, if people want to see your film work, where can they go? Thank you for asking, Justin. They can go to thomastory.com. And Justin, if people want to see what our company Bad Theology is up to, where can they go? They, of course, can go to badtheologypictures.com or follow us on what? Instagram at badtheology. Get in touch with us, too. Listener questions, anything on your mind at hey at two friends with a podcast.com. That's our email address. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. All right, dude. We did it. Two friends. Two I think friends. that the I think that the with two friends is better than two friends because I think the acronym looks better on paper. With two friends. Because it's never been used. Oh, that's a good acronym. With two friends. We can get a lot of mileage out of that. Yeah.